Welcome, food enthusiasts, to this issue of the Future Foodcast. I'm Pam Line Miller, your host, and I, as always, am interviewing another thought leader in the food space. We have with us today Maria Frank. She is the marketing director with Baton Rouge Grill House and Bar, and we are delighted to have her with us. Welcome to the podcast, Maria. Hi, thank you so much for having me here, Pamela. Yes, sure. Well, tell us a little bit about Baton Rouge as we get started so that we can use that to frame our conversation. Sure. Um, So Baton Rouge is a Canadian chain. We have 28 locations in Eastern Canada, predominantly in the Quebec, in the province of Quebec, as well as Ontario and Halifax as well. Okay, that's 28 locations. That's a very large footprint that you have. And what kind of cuisine do you offer? Because you're a grill house and a bar. So I'm making some assumptions, but what have you got? So we're a casual dining concept. And yes, we have 28 locations, but we're also growing. And our cuisine is uh, we're mainly known for our ribs, our signature barbecue pork back ribs. That represents a big chunk of our sales mix. And it's uh, a classic that our guests keep coming back for. We also are known for our uh, high quality steak and as well as some other signature items on our menu that our fans and customers have come to love over the last 30 years. Yeah. Now, do you have a special sauce that goes on your ribs or what makes your ribs so much of a, a desirous? I mean, why are you known for your ribs? What's special about them? Well, I can't give away our trade secret, Oh, (laughs) (laughs) but I will say that we put a lot of effort into uh, the preparation behind our ribs. Um, It's a pretty lengthy preparation process, and they're also cooked at low heat for seven and a half hours before they're served Uh, to our guests. Okay. So that's pretty heavy, intense, labor intensive process that you go through with your ribs. We won't give any away any secrets. I don't want you to do that, (laughs) but that's really important. Um, And you've been in existence for how long? The brand has been around for 30 years. We're celebrating 30 years this year. It was founded in uh, 1992 in uh, Laval, which is a suburb of uh, Montreal. It's part of the greater Montreal area in Mm -hmm. Quebec, Canada. And uh, we've been growing since Wow. And celebrating 30 years, I'm sure you have some special things planned for your brand and your locations. Yes, absolutely. We kicked off our celebrations with our signature ribs at 1992 in honor of our founding year, of course, uh, which represents a pretty good value to our guests. It was about a 7 to $8 dollar discount depending on the market that you're in and uh, that spanned about three weeks and now we've entered into the other stage of our celebration which is um, something that we're doing um, to really honor our uh, our rebrand from steakhouse to grill house it's our grill house tower and that combines all of our classics in one neat two level tower Um, it includes our ribs of course it includes our steak our chicken tenders which are a signature of our brand uh, some shrimp some grilled vegetables um, and it's a perfect shareable for about three to four people. I was going to I was going to say, as you were talking <laughs> about all that food, I was thinking, surely that is just not for one person. But you yeah. said shareable <laughs> for three or four. I feel a lot better. <laughs> I was thinking the Canadians are really <laughs> chowing down at the grill house. Yeah, we I have big imagine. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, well, the restaurant business really and in Canada, especially with the pandemic and what's been happening. So so how have the last couple of years been for your brand and your location? Locations. How how did that all roll out as the pandemic was hitting? Uh, it's been a pretty turbulent two and a half years now, right? Gonna, yeah. We're going on almost three. Um, at, at the beginning, we were just like any other restaurant in the world or industry. We didn't quite know what was happening. The majority of our locations had to close. We kept uh, some of our franchisees, by the way, our, our chain is a, is a franchise concept. Um, okay. So some of our franchisees um, kept their doors open all throughout and were only available through takeout or pickup. Uh, there was no there was no dine in capabilities. And then, I mean, in where we are in Quebec and Canada, there were a lot of openings, closings, lockdowns curfews. So there there was a lot. It was a lot for our franchisees. It was a lot for our brand. Uh, one thing, though, that we did do as a brand is we um, continued always being present in the community. We tried to get involved in as many initiatives as possible. We, we donated food to our healthcare workers, our frontline workers. We remain present on social media. We continue doing digital marketing. It's something I noticed that a lot of brands and restaurants stop doing. But uh, for our brand, we, we really continue to be top of mind for our communities and our guests. 
Well, I think that's a really important point, Maria, that, you know, from a marketing perspective, you really, your franchisees are involved in their communities. So everybody was going through this together. If you're a franchisee in a certain area and you've got one or more locations, you know, all of your customers, you're experiencing things with your customers. So the fact that you made the effort to stay connected and support the people that were supporting you and your customers, I think that says a lot for your brand. You just didn't hide under a rock. You tried to be out there doing, you know, takeout or whatever was allowed at the time based on the regulations that were in place or the situations um, with lockdowns or whether restaurants had to be closed or open. Uh, do you think that really was the engagement good with your clients? Were they communicating with you? How did that go over? Yeah, no, definitely. We were yeah. they were using a lot of social media to communicate with us, uh, private messages okay. through Facebook, uh, calling the locations. Uh, there was definitely a very big connection between our guests and those locations that were open, because like I said, a lot of them were not. Yeah. And one important thing that I have to mention is that pre-COVID, our chain at large did roughly 1% of sales were takeout or delivery sales. So it was a very, very right. small percentage. So mm -hmm. the pandemic really forced us to, to pivot um, and to sort of make our stuff takeout friendly, to source new takeout uh, containers because, you know, like styrofoam wouldn't wouldn't cut it for our brand. Our brand is premium. So that, that was a big job that we had to do um, anywhere between finding those containers, finding takeout bags that represented our brand well, all these things that we didn't really think about to, to COVID, all of a sudden, you know, we, we had to pivot just like I'm sure a lot of industries and restaurants and brands had to do. Yeah, they really did. And you are definitely not alone there. I've heard that story over and over again, I guess. But part of the question is, so you had 1% pre-COVID, then you really had to, like you say, pivot. And we'll talk about supply chain in a minute because <laughs> finding those to-go containers, like you said, that would represent your brand, that was probably a whole other situation. But now that things have opened back up quite a bit, what does your takeout percentage look like now? Did you go back to down closer to 1% or have you stayed up or what's that look like? We've actually stayed up. We're at around 10%, give or take wow. for the brand, depending on the week. Um, and these, what we're noticing are incremental sales. So they're not cannibalizing the dine-in sales, which are good. So it's sales that we didn't really have before. And now we have them, but you know, something to be mindful of. It's more work. Our restaurants are very busy Friday, Saturday. Those two evenings represent 50% of the, of the week sales. So it's not always the easiest thing for our franchisees to have the off-premise apps like Uber Eats on all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but those who are able to meet up with the demand, definitely those are incremental sales for sure. Well, and that's exciting, honestly, from a marketing perspective, the fact that you yeah. were honestly not not from anything that you did, but how you reacted to what was happening in your environment, that, that you were able to have those incremental sales. And hopefully uh, they're able to get the staff and you know be able to support that incremental growth. Like you said, they, they might have to turn off some of the apps or, or not serve during certain times or whatever that might be. But let's talk about, well, a couple of things that, that we've touched on. Supply chain is one. That was the first one. Staffing is the second. But with supply chain, as far as resourcing all of your materials now, what's happening with that? Because I, it's in the news and I hear that, you know, how are your providers doing? Uh, or do you have multiple providers now that you've got to access? Because the supply chain, everybody's not able to get what they used to from their old suppliers. Uh, we work with a lot of suppliers. Um, everything is centralized through a distribution center. So that okay. facilitates a lot of the deliveries that go into our location. But of course, working with various suppliers comes with various problems. Right now, in this moment in time, it's a lot more stable than it's been in the last little while. So that's allowing us to be innovative with our menu, to have uh, new shoes, to, to give in to what our guests want. They want new, fresh, exciting items on our menu. Uh, but every day is a challenge. Every day, you know, something can come at us. We get often emails saying, um, you know, the supplier can't, can no longer provide the specific dessert. So as a team, as a brand, we have to, you know, be agile and we have to pivot. And that's one of the biggest learnings that came from COVID is you need to be agile. 
And that's something that needs to always be sort of top of mind. Yeah. And I think, as you mentioned, innovation was really important to your brand too, pre-COVID. And I think during COVID, you kind of had to just do probably essentials. And now you're able to get back to some of that innovation. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah. 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 Slowly so but surely, we are definitely. And we <laughs> slowly have to but surely, <laughs> all fingers crossed, <laughs> yeah. all, all fingers crossed um, to be able to do that. I know that your clients like that better too. You know, yeah. look forward to what you're going to do with the brand. Well, how, how has staffing been? Has that been by location or you know, overall, are your franchisees, they doing okay? Or are they having some issues or? Uh, staffing is a big problem. It was a problem pre-COVID and now it's an even bigger problem. It's a challenge, definitely. Mm-hmm. Some locations, of course, do a little bit better than others, but I feel like all of them are on the edge. They're always, you know, like one person away from being short staffed. It's very difficult for the restaurant industry at large, and it's no different for us. Uh, there are things that we're trying to do from, from a brand perspective to, you know, incentivize our staff. We try to have contests to make sure that they're motivated, but it's definitely a challenge at the moment. And it'll probably, yeah. it's probably going to be for a very long time. COVID shifted a lot of habits, but it also shifted the way people work, uh, the work people want to do. And uh, those in the restaurant industry, I think, sort of went away from restaurants during that period and never went back. Okay, that's an interesting thought. But you also mentioned like trying to keep your staff that you that you have. I'm sure you have some loyal staff that that stayed, not just um, some of the come and go. I think that's probably a certain percentage of the restaurant worker. But you also have that that core of people. Are there things that your franchisees are doing to help maintain those? Because I know a lot of our listeners might be in the restaurant industry trying to figure out how do we how do we keep hold of our staff. Um, yeah, our managers, we've noticed are very loyal. And from oh. a head office point of view, we've, we've tried to sort of highlight their longevity with the brand. But there's some interesting things that I've heard directly from our franchisees. Some could be as simple, like I said, as contests. Um, others can be, you know, um, uh, restaurant discounts. But one of our franchisees, he does extraordinary things for the community as well as for his staff. And he's actually mm-hmm. least cars for some of his managers. He's given them company cars. Um, really? Just, you, yes just to, you know, make sure that they're happy, make sure that they're well taken care of. Um, and it's something that's extremely admirable, obviously difficult to do. It's not something that can be applied across the board, but it's just something that I had heard and I thought was very, very generous on his part. Yeah, that's absolutely, obviously very generous. And with the margins in the restaurant business, a great achievement. So <laughs> because, yeah, exactly. you know, the, the, you know, trying to watch all of that and then take what at what profits you do have and giving a good percentage of that to support your employees. I think that's really admirable, like you said. Wow. Well, is there anything else? Because it sounds like that, and I'm not saying, I'm saying Baton Rouge, very American, but you say Baton Rouge <laughs> as far as the restaurant name. So I apologize for not having quite the pronunciation that I should. Thanks for okay. doing that properly. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a really, uh, you know, cutting edge and innovative brand and your franchisees and you obviously supporting them from the marketing perspective seem really interested in how your customers and clients are doing and meeting their needs and really partnering with them. And I think that's so admirable in the restaurant business. I, you know, we don't hear that a lot and um, it's hard work. <laughs> It's very hard work. And I have to say that the dominant theme amongst all our franchisees is passion. They really, truly have a passion for the brand, for the business. They want to give their guests the very best. Um, You know, sometimes inevitably we have to have difficult conversations about certain products that need to be changed, whether it's due to supply issues or cost. And most of the time our franchisees fight tooth and nail and, you know, they never want to compromise quality and you always want to give the best. And that's, that's something that I think is rare in the restaurant industry. So I I have to say that passion really dominates a lot of the decisions and actions that we take as a brand. Yeah. And that's really exciting. Thank you for sharing that with us. We have talked about a lot of different things here about your brand and the restaurants and how you're handling some of the challenges that are in the industry right now. Is there anything else that you'd like to leave our audience with before we go today? I think just to sum it up, 
you know, the restaurant industry is a, is a hard industry, but I think it's also extremely rewarding, uh, not only from a financial perspective, but like I said, it, can, it brings a lot of passion, it brings a lot of opportunity to connect with, with people, with your community. There's a lot of good things that can come out of those connections. And I think in a world where we're losing a lot of connections, I think that the restaurant industry is really able to bridge the person to person connection. And I think that's something that's very important. Well, wow. back to community and relationships and here's to being able to dine out at a restaurant in person. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people listening to our podcast, especially our Canadian friends, which we have quite a listenership there, will be excited to try your brand if they haven't already. Uh, Maria, thank you so much for sharing with us today on the Future Foodcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Future Foodcast. Future Foodcast is powered by Farm to Plate, the leading food blockchain platform. Subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date with the very latest innovations in the food industry. 